Okay, my topic. My topic is the authority of the Bible. The authority of God's Word. And uh, I think most of you believe that. Perhaps all of us. Before I begin, uh, I want to give you just a little uh, tutorial on this. So that you will have some... uh, Some things at your fingertip when the authority of the Word of God is questioned in the society in which we live. Uh, thank you, Cass, for the opportunity. And this was my assigned topic this morning, and I, or this evening, and I'm glad to do that. Um, let me take you back to a Bible class. I was sitting in a church with a group of ladies. I haven't often been asked to teach uh, ladies Bible class, but on this particular occasion I was. And in the course of, of uh, teaching that class, um, I, uh, let me see if we get, okay, uh, uh, in the course of teaching that class, um, something came up about Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, you will remember that Satan cast doubt on the word of God. So this problem of the authority of God's word has been going on since the Garden of Eden. Uh, So it's not new to our generation. And uh, uh, it hasn't gone away either. And first Satan cast doubt, and then he actually denied. He said, ye shall not surely So the debate about the authority of the Word of God started when? A long time ago. Before us. Before our time. And uh, I was just in the matter of fact saying that Satan in the garden cast doubt on the Word of God. At the end when the question and answer time came up, a lady raised her hand and said, Why did you call the serpent in the garden, Satan. Do you believe that was Satan? On what authority? How do you, why do we call the tempter in the garden Satan? Well, the answer is pretty simple. The authority of the Bible. Uh, remember this uh, This verse in Revelation, and the great dragon was thrown down, that's one name, that ancient serpent, there's another name, who is called, huh, the devil and Satan. So if the Bible calls the serpent in the garden Satan, can we do that? What authority, what right, why? Why? The answer is on the authority of the Word of God. Now, I think a lot of times we're inclined to say, well, I believe, and that's a good thing to do, to believe the Word of God. But I think it's a good thing to to remind folks that I, I believe the Bible, I believe the Bible, and that's what the Bible says. Um. So, uh, our final authority is what? The Bible, right? Here's a statement um, that says that. It says, we believe that the completed scriptures of the Old and New Testament are verbally inspired by God and are equally inerrant in all their parts as originally written. They're sufficient for godliness and are our supreme and final authority in faith and practice. Do you agree with that statement? Say amen. Um, Does anybody recognize what document? We were talking about documents earlier. That comes from a document. Uh, What? (laughs) Yeah. That comes from the 
constitution of having a body. Yeah, it comes out of one of those documents. Pretty important document. But notice the authority is placed in the scriptures. The completed scriptures of the Old and New Testament. So that's why uh, we're going to be tomorrow looking at both Old and New Testament with, with Dr. Gentry. Uh, verbally, down to, the, down to the words of Scripture, inspired by God and equally inerrant in all their parts as originally written, uh, the orthographa, uh, the original autographs. So uh, we don't have those original documents, but we have some early documents. And one of the great things about... Uh, uh, about the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, was that we found documents that were a thousand years older than the oldest documents we had, and they were very much the same. Uh, the Hebrew of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Hebrew, we ha Hebrew uh, documents we had prior to that, a thousand years difference in the book of Isaiah, for instance, and uh, and and. We could see the reliability of the scripture, but we could also see how they had been preserved uh, through the time of history. They are sufficient for life and godliness and our supreme and final authority in faith and practice, what we believe and how we behave. And Dr. Gentry's used those terms several times in, in faith and practice. Now, I want us to read the primary scripture that says that, so if you'll stand with me, uh, Pastor Jason has us do this regularly, and it's a good way of, of recognizing the authority of the Word of God. So uh, can you see can you see that okay from where you, where you sit? Okay, let's read together uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. And how from childhood... You have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Thank you. you may be seated. Now, you ask the question... Where do we find evidence of the authority of the Word of God? And here's one of the best places. 2 Timothy 3. So find it in your Bible because we're going to be looking at some, some verses nearby. So whatever portion of the Word of God and your Bible's there in the pew. If you didn't bring one, uh, use your uh, electronic um, now, I want you to notice that according to these verses, the Bible is breathed, what's the word after that? The Bible is breathed out by God. Is there a difference between breathing in and breathing out? Okay, take, take a deep breath. Now, yeah, yeah, okay. Now, there are people, the reason we make this distinction is because there are people that would say, okay, men wrote books, and then God, God breathed on them and made them sacred scripture. Now, that's not what this verse teaches. This verse teaches that the Bible was breathed out by God. Now notice, I want to call your attention to the fact that we've got a lot of names we can use for this book, right? Uh, we can call it, uh, we can call it right here in, in, verse, in verse 15, the sacred writings, and that from childhood, what, what books would uh, Timothy have learned from childhood? He probably would have learned the books of the law. Um, 
What books did not he learn from childhood? New Testament. Why not? Hadn't been written yet, right? So sacred writings probably is a, a term referring to the Old Testament. I'm sure you want another name for it, uh, Jim, tell you. Sacred writings. <laughs> sacred writings. Probably a, a term for the Old Testament part of the Bible. So there's, there's names there. Now in verse 16, we have that, that title, Scripture. Uh, scripture. Now notice that, that Timothy learned this from, and the word there is brephos. Uh, From childhood, now, are our kids learning the Bible from childhood? Trudy asked me Wednesday night uh, when I got home from Awana, uh, how was Awana tonight? And my answer was very simple. There were kids all around the table. So when we were back here in uh, uh, in TNT, there were kids. There were childhood. There were kids memorizing Scripture. So Timothy is being taught. Now, who's teaching your kids? That's that's parents, grandparents. Thank God for spiritual leaders, but the first job falls to the parents. That's that's our job. We at the church, we supplement, we help, we assist. But and that from childhood. Now, uh, Timothy had some godly influence in his life. Anybody remember who? Timothy's a mother and a grandmother, yeah. And the mother and grandmother taught, taught him. Uh, his grandmother's name was Lois, and his mother's name was Eunice, 2 Timothy 1.5. In verse 16, it's, the term used is scripture, graphe. Now notice that Paul says, continue in what you've learned. Verse 14, as for you... Continuing what you've learned. Now, can I pause right there and say, you want, you want something put on your prayer list? Put in your prayer list that your kids, as they grow up, and your grandkids will what? Continue. So you pray for yourself, God help me to teach them. But then God help them to continue in what they've learned. Now that's that's a tough thing if they haven't learned the right stuff, right? So some stuff we, we, we don't want them continuing in. But, but if we're the ones teaching them the sacred writings, we're teaching them the scripture. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 2. Preach, what's the name for the Bible there? Preach the word. Um, the Awana verse. Anybody know what the Awana verse is? Somebody help me. What's the reference for the Awana verse? Awana workers. Uh, hmm. It's just the chapter before. It's Second Timothy two fifteen. So look there at Second Timothy. 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling. Now, what's the title for the Bible in that verse? The Word of Truth. Rightly handling the Word of Truth. Notice the different names for the Bible, sacred writings, scripture, the Word, the Word of Truth. Uh, These are different names for one book that has lots of names. You want to find a lot of the names for the Bible, you might try. uh, And by the way, if you want that book, be the first to claim it. It's on the table here. Um, Let me find it. I'm giving away the books again. Uh, Hang around because I'm going to get to tell you I'm throwing away some books too. Uh, Not tonight, but I'll tell you about that. But uh, there's Kevin DeYoung's book on. And in the first chapter, 
he goes to Psalm 119, and uh, he, he talks about all the different names um, for, uh, for the Bible in, in Psalm 119. By the way, if you'll, if you'll read a chapter in one of those books, you may have it. If you take it home and you don't want it, bring it back. I'll find someone who does. Okay. Um, so the Bible is breathe, say it, out, out by God. Breathe out by God. Now, there's a lot of names, but there's only one source. All scripture is breathed out by God. Breathe out. You remember that when God made Adam, he took dust to the ground, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. This is God breathing out the sacred writings, the scripture. God didn't breathe into words that men wrote, but they were breathed out from God. A verse that says that clearly is 2 Peter 1. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. Notice it's from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Scripture is breathed out, breathed out by God. Did you hear about the mama that was, uh, had a pastor come to visit her and her children, and uh, he was getting ready to read some scripture, and uh, he said to the, to the mother, uh, could you, could you uh, get a Bible? And she called the kids, and she said, uh, honey, go get the book that mama loves. What book would they get in our house? Go get the book Daddy Loves. Uh, Now that story's a little dated. Guess what book the kids brought? Sears Roebuck Catalog. (laughs) Yeah, Sears Roebuck Catalog. Uh, You you probably, any of y'all don't know what a Sears, Levi, you know what a Sears Roebuck Catalog (laughs) is? There's a lot of human authors that God used. But God is the source of Scripture. That's why it has authority. It is from God. It is breathed out by God. So Dr. Ryrie, um, in his definition, brings the human author and the divine author together. And he says, it's God's su- inspiration, it's God's superintendence of the human author. So that using their own personalities, they compose and recorded without error his revelation in the words of the original autograph. So those, those words that were written down use the, use the human author's personality uh, and yet uh, protected and breathed out the word of God so that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So I think that's one of the, that addresses one of the questions. How can we believe in the authority of the Bible if it was written by 40 different people? 40 different authors. So it has to be, we have to understand that those authors were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, much like, did anybody uh, see the floods carrying things along? You know, the, so they were carried along, they were born along, they were controlled by uh, uh, the Holy Spirit of God. Remember Matthew 4.4? 4, 4? What was the occasion of Jesus' words, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God? What was the occasion? Temptation. temptation. Okay. And, and Jesus responds to temptation with the authority of the word of God. It is written, and he's quoting the Old Testament scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. But notice how Jesus describes Scripture. But every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, Scripture, the Bible, is breathed out by God. It comes 
from the mouth of God. When Billy Graham was preaching, he'd often hold up the book and he would say, anybody remember what Billy Graham said? The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Very clearly, he was distinguishing his authority was the Bible. The Bible says the accuracy of the Bible. The Bible is our authority. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. The Word of God has the authority of God. God speaks through His Word. The accuracy of the Bible is assured because it is from God. Now, I have on... Where is that... uh, Yes, I have the inspiration authority of the Bible by B.B. Warfield on the table over here. In that book, B.B. Warfield says the Bible is God's word in such a way that whatever the Bible says, God says. So it would be equally appropriate for Billy Graham to say God says because We believe the Bible is from God. It is breathed out by God. It has the authority of God. And God's word is superior to man's word. Man's words don't have the same authority as the word of God. So let's talk about a term, worldview. Y'all hear that? Y'all hear that word a lot? Worldview. What, What do we mean by worldview? What's a... What's a Christian worldview? So several of the books over here uh, talk about having a a biblical worldview. One of them comes from Master Seminary. And uh, it's this one, Think Biblically, Recovering a Christian Worldview. So this quote comes from that book. A Christian worldview begins with the conviction that God himself has spoken in Scripture. As Christians, we're committed to the Bible as the inerrant and authoritative Word of God. We believe it is reliable and true. How much? All of it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. That's a quote from thinking, think biblically, recovering a Christian worldview. Worldview. Here's another, another statement from that book. Scripture, therefore, is the standard, the rule, the Torah, the law, by which we treat we all other truth claims. Unless that axiom dominates our perspective on all of life, we cannot legitimately claim to have embraced a Christian worldview. So in order to have a Christian worldview... The truth, the standard for truth is what? The Bible. The Bible, that's the standard of truth. A truly Christian worldview, simply put, is one in which the word of God, rightly understood, is firmly established as both the foundation and the final authority for everything that we hold true. So the Bible is authoritative because It comes from God. Now, we live in a day that's rejected absolute truth. And there are two terms for that that I want to mention. Uh, One of those terms is relativism. And another term is postmodernism. And both of those terms involve a rejection of the authority of the word of God. So here's what uh, Philip Ryken writes about in The City on a Hill. He says, we live in a day that rejects absolute truth. Relativism has been put in its place. And tongue-in-cheek. So the British poet Steve Turner isn't saying what he believes, but he's saying what (laughs) society believes. He says, society believes that every man must find the truth that's right for him. Reality must adapt accordingly. Does reality adapt? No, reality doesn't. But that's what relativism believes. Reality 
would adapt. There's, there's what's true for you and what's true for you and what's true for me. And uh, uh, so relativism has been put in the place of truth. No one knows anything with, with objective certainty. It all depends on your point of view. Postmodernism says you have your story, I have more, my story, but there's no divinely ordained story that ties them all together. The only absolute is there are no absolutes. Your worldview is simply your opinion. So we need to understand that we believe the Bible is breathed out by God. And because it is breathed out by God, it has final authority. We're going to look at the two areas of authority. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 again. All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for what? Teaching. It's profitable for correct doctrine. So what we believe we get from? Get from the Bible. That's, that's the authority of God. We believe in the authority of the Bible because it is breathed out by God and it is the final authority for correct doctrine, for what is truth. Now, what do, we know? what do we want to know about? Well, as God's people, we want to know about Jesus. So notice 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures breathed by, out by God and profitable for teaching. So if we want to learn about Jesus, where would we learn the authoritative truth about Jesus? In the book we call the Bible. We want to learn about salvation. Where would we learn about salvation? From childhood you're acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation. So it's the final authority for correct doctrine. Who Jesus is? Here's a, a quote from Michael Zwiegel in this book called Retro Christianity. I'll tell you some more about it in a moment. He says, biblical Christianity points us to the person and work of Christ. In his first and second coming as the central theme of the Bible, of theology, of Christian life, of reality, the center of Christianity has always been Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute. I thought we believed in the authority of the Bible. Well, we do believe in the authority of the Bible, but we don't worship the Bible, do we? We worship the God of the Bible. And the Bible tells us has the authoritative revelation of God. Uh, in the book Already Gone, Ken Ham talks about teenagers. And what's happened to teenagers? How, how do we know Jesus rose from the dead? So tell me, uh, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Whoa. Historical evidence? What's the evidence? The most reliable evidence, the resurrection of Jesus it's found in the pages of the Word of God. We don't have eyewitnesses alive today. We know it's true because the Bible tells us so. Jesus loves me, this I know. What? Well, the Bible tells me so. It is the God-breathed revelation from God. The center of Christianity is Jesus. And he is the way of salvation according to the Bible. The Bible tells us about the one true God. The one true God, his attributes, uh, what he's done and what he does, his authoritative revelation. And we worship the God of the Bible. The Bible teaches us who Jesus is, the way of salvation, the one true God. You could keep adding to that list, couldn't you? I'm going to give you just one more kind of a catch-all. The Bible teaches us what is truth. A number of the books that I brought in tonight talk about that subject of truth. Dr. Gentry was saying uh, uh, that he remembers when this book, No Place for Truth, came out, and it was influential in his thinking uh, and this is by David Wells. Uh, the, battle, the Battle for Truth is another one by, uh, by David Noble. And uh, here's one 
um, called by Tim LaHaye called Mind Siege and uh, On Guard uh, by William Craig. Uh, there's a battle going on for truth. And, and we need to be equipped. And when, we are, when we're engaged in battle against Satan, our weapon is... Our weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we're going to be engaged in this conflict um, and, and truth and falsehood. So one of the books is called uh, Truth and Half-Truth and, and Falsehoods. And, and in our society today, uh, that battle is going on, and that's why you and I need to be secure in knowing where, where truth comes from. Now, that guy named Martin Luther, he did what? Remember he, uh, this is talking about the Diet of Worms, which is in, in uh, 1721, but uh, Paul, he did the nailing on the church door, the castle church. What was that date? 1517, and can you give me a day of the year? A, a what? October. What do we call that day? <laughs> Depends on who you're talking to, right? <laughs> Have you heard any, any of that in the news? Like, you know, okay, next week is, well, Martin Luther was examined because he dared to question the authority of his day. Well, what was that authority? Well, actually, there were three authorities. And those three authorities sometimes contradicted each other. And so he says, unless I'm convicted by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept, here's the other two, the authority of popes and councils. So, he says, they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant, for to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. And, and within days, he was where? Well, he was actually captured by friends and, and taken uh, into safekeeping and during that time, he was translating the, uh, the German Bible. But he ended up being an outlaw to the church. He ended up being ostracized. He, he ended up having to, to go into hiding because he took his stand, what we're talking about tonight, the authority of the Bible. It cost him dearly, but it lit the fires of the, of the Reformation. Martin Luther later said, one passage of scripture has more authority than all the books of the world. So, the authority, so did it start with Martin Luther? Was he the first guy who decided the Bible had authority? Well, no. We can go back in history and find some others. Go back to Augustine or St. Augustine, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Canonical scripture has paramount authority to which we yield ascend in all matters which we ought not to be ignorant and yet cannot know of ourselves and that's a quote from this book retro uh, Christianity uh, Michael Zweigel is a patristic author who's gone back to study uh, the early church especially the the writers right after the apostles and he, he talks about what has the church believed throughout church history, and uh, that he, he, he teaches us is very important. Here's one, one more, Anselm of Canterbury. He says, I'm sure that if I say anything which plainly opposes Holy Scripture, it is false. And if I'm, a, and if I'm aware of it, I no longer hold it. Now, is that the view of the, the people around us? People say, you know, if I say something against Scripture, then, you know, I'm not going to believe it anymore. 
once you show me. So when you show people what the Bible says, they say, oh, oh, okay, I submit. Is that what we experience? Uh, and, and often they will respond, you're not interpreting that right, or Paul wasn't uh, uh, authoritative when he said that. They have a lot of, a lot of things to say. So Zwiegel, in his book, says, our evangelical assistance on Scripture as the final authority in all matters of faith and practice has strong historical roots. History demonstrates the absolute authority of Scripture is, in fact, a fundamental view of the church that has been believed. And notice he has three things. It's been believed everywhere, all across Christendom, always, ever since the times of the apostles, by all, by all, that is, by the universal church. Now, let's go back to worldview. What is a worldview? A worldview is a collection of our presuppositions, our convictions, our values, from which a person tries to understand and make sense of the world. So we're, we're dumping everything into this, into this box, and we're trying to sort it all out and make it fit. But a biblical worldview says that the Bible has authority over it all, by which everything we believe and by which we interpret and judge reality. I'm going to skip this one. So what do we mean when we say Scripture is sufficient? We mean the Bible is adequate. It's an adequate guide for matters of faith and conduct. It teaches us the truth we need for life and godliness. So the Bible's breathed out by God. The Bible has final authority for correct doctrine. And we've said many times tonight, the Bible is the final authority for, for daily conduct. We see it here it's breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So it's profitable for reproof. That word means to rebuke uh, or to refute. Uh, and, and when we're sinning, we need to be rebuked. When we're in error, we need to be refuted. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. That is, it sets us on the right path. It's profitable for training in righteousness. So if you're learning a new sport, you need to, you need to learn it correctly. If you're learn, learning to write, when you're, when you're learning how to, how to write your letters, your kids are, are being taught, they need, to, they need to be trained the right way. And, and what's the purpose? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, uh, there's been a lot of attack against the Bible. Since, since the times of the apostles, in, in our day, and uh, Zwiegel, uh, here's uh, Vincent of Lorenz, is quoted by Zwiegel, he says, we hold that faith that has believe, been believed, there's those three things again, everywhere, always, by all. So, I want to end with Joshua 1.8 and then a simple story. Joshua 1.8, so I've been reading in Joshua in preparation for tonight, you remember that Moses, my servant, is dead. God said to Joshua, now therefore lead the children of Israel into the land that I promised them. And uh, uh, God says to Joshua, these are his words to Joshua, this book of the law should not depart from your mouth. The oral reading of scripture, we need to do that, don't we, Pastor Jason? We need to read it aloud. Should not, see, they were oral learners, should not depart from, a, from your mouth, but notice You've got to get your mind involved, too. You shall meditate on it day and night. You may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. John MacArthur tells a story, and I've told it before, and hold the punchline if you've heard me tell this story. John MacArthur tells a story of being invited to speak to a youth camp. And his first sermon at youth camp was similar to what I've spoken on tonight, was on the authority of the Bible, that we have to submit our minds to the, to the Word of God. And when he got done, I mean, the leaders of the camp came up in his face 
and started talking. Are you kidding me, Dr. MacArthur? Do you really believe everything the Bible says? I can't believe you're stupid enough to believe that. Huh. Anybody remember the story now? Anybody remember the story? So Dr. MacArthur was just kind of blown back, you know, okay, what do you say when someone says, I can't believe you're stupid enough to believe that? He says, well, uh, um, and what are you stupid enough to believe? I hope that you stand with Dr. MacArthur and you're stupid enough to believe the authority of the Word of God. It is, we've got to decide, will, will we judge the Word of God or will the Word of God judge us? Will it judge our thinking and our behavior, our beliefs and our behavior, or will we be judged by the Word of God? If you stand in judgment of the Word of God, that's, then you're in the, in the stream of society in which we live today. But if you stand on the authority of the Word of God, expect somebody to say it in a different way. Well, you know, times have changed. And we don't believe that anymore. Things are different now. Um, you've got to catch up. Uh, but we believe in the authority of the Word of God. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, God, we don't know when we're going to be confronted with someone who simply does not accept the authority of the Word of God. Help us to know how to respond. Guide us, Lord, whether to confront that, to listen, to learn, to try to uh, get a hearing. Help us, Lord, to know when to when to do as, as Jesus did to Satan, to quote the Word of God, the Bible says, it is written, God is Lord, but help us to understand the Word of God is our weapon. It's the shield of faith. And help us to quench the fiery darts of Satan with it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Cass?